Good morning. As Harold mentioned a few weeks ago, we had our Vacation Bible School, our VBS. And during the Bible lessons of our VBS, we focused obviously on God, but there was one primary human biblical character that we focused on, and it was David. And when we think about David from the Bible, there's lots of thoughts that might come to mind, but probably the most famous account with David is when he faced Goliath, right? David and Goliath, it's one of the, 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 the most memorable scenes that we can imagine in our minds of this giant standing nine feet, nine inches tall, this, this experienced warrior, this strong man, and, and then on the other side of the valley, we see this young boy, this shepherd boy, who's probably 16 or 17 years old, and, and, and the, the scene couldn't be more different on, on either side, the armies. You got on one side, the Philistines are probably laughing and mocking, and, and, and Goliath, their champion, is mocking the armies of Israel. He's mocking God, and, and then on the side of the Israelites, you, you, you probably can just sense this quietness, this anxiety, this fear. And, and there's probably multiple perspectives, but there's, I just want to narrow in on two perspectives. There's David's perspective, and there's most everybody else's perspective. Most everybody else is probably thinking, this is going to get ugly. <laughs> and, and yet David goes up to Goliath, and he says, you come to me with a sword, a spear, a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, and you have taunted him. See, there's different perspectives. There's obviously this big obstacle Goliath. There's a big problem. And most everybody sees the problem, but David has a different perspective that he was on God's side and that Goliath was opposing God. David's perspective was unique. And oftentimes we, we approach life, we face obstacles, we face trials, we face struggles, and a lot of times we see them and we think in the physical. We think in the tangible, in the concrete what makes sense? How do I handle this problem? What do I need to do? What kind of strategy do I need to employ to attack this obstacle? And in the, the analogy of David and Goliath, people would think, well, what is David going to do to Goliath? But David had a perspective that was beyond the physical. He knew that he was on God's side and that Goliath was taunting him. David was thinking in the spiritual and sometimes when we just think about life and our obstacles in the physical dimension, we miss out on an entirely real spiritual world that God is in control and that God can handle any of our problems. This morning we're going to be looking at a text. Please turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6, much like the story of David and Goliath, has a big obstacle but there's also varying perspectives that we are going to see in 2 Kings chapter 6. This morning, before we leave here, I, I have a general goal every time I preach that you would leave here encouraged in the Lord. That you will be encouraged from the Word of God. That you will find some truth from God's Word that will encourage you to trust Him more. Or that you would fear Him more. Or that you would leave here motivated to obey Him more in a general sense, but in a specific sense, my goal this morning is that you would leave here with your eyes open. Now, hopefully I don't make your eyes go closed in our study of the text, but I want you to leave here with your eyes spiritually opened, that you would be looking for things that maybe you wouldn't have looked for before. And my hope in that you would leave here with your spiritual eyes open is that you will better experience the peace that God wants to give you as a believer, as someone who is trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you would better experience the peace that God wants you to have in your life. And I also want you to leave here being more effective as a servant in God's kingdom. All right? So let's get into the text in 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 8. Now the king of Aram, or your Bible might say Syria, same thing, just like America and United States, we're talking about the same thing. The king of Aram, or Syria, was warring against Israel. And he came.
counseled with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. So he was talking with his inner council, probably his leaders, his captains, his generals, and saying, This is where I want us to go. And usually in war, you don't tell the enemy what you're going to do, right? You kind of try to keep it in-house so that you can surprise them. So he's telling his army or his, his leaders, this is where we're going to go when we fight Israel. Verse 9, the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware that you do not pass this place for the Arameans are coming down there. Now we know from the text the man of God is Elisha, the prophet Elisha. Five times in chapters 5 and 6, he's referred to as the man of God. Think about what a cool identity that is. That his identity is being associated as him linked with God. And did you know that as a believer in Jesus, you're a son of God or a daughter of God? The Bible says that you have an identity in Christ. That you are related with God in a way that is very unique. So when we see this man of God, Elisha, in one sense, was linked with God. He was close with God. He feared God. He walked with God. And that's how people knew him. He was the man of God. So the man of God, Elisha, sent word to the king. And he says, don't go here, because when you go here, that's where the Arameans or the Syrians are going to be. So, verse 10, the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him. And thus he warned him, so he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Basically what it just said is that the king of Israel took the advice of Elisha and he actually sent to go see where Elisha said don't go and that's where the Arameans were. He actually listened to what Elisha told him to do and just to verify what happened, he looked into it and guess what? He realized that that would have been a disaster if he had not listened to Elisha. Now another part of the story that I didn't mention is that this is the king of Israel is a guy by the name of Jehoram. Probably not a familiar name to us, but we probably know who his parents are. Ahab and Jezebel. You guys have heard those names before, I'm sure, right? So if you were to venture, do you think that Ahab and Jezebel's son was like them or unlike them in his relationship with the Lord God? He followed in the footsteps of his parents. The Bible says that he was an evil king. Now, he wasn't quite as bad as Ahab and Jezebel. It actually says he wasn't quite as bad, kind of in a, a paraphrased way of saying that. But he was still, uh, he, he forsook the Lord. And he was not leading the nation of Israel in the way that the nation of Israel should have been following God. So you'd say, well, why is Elisha helping him? Good question, right? But think about this. Elisha, who was walking with God, wanted his people to walk with God. And one of the ways in which hopefully he could influence his nation to walk with God was influencing the leaders to walk with God, right? So, think about this in an application sense. If we want our nation to walk with God, hopefully we should be praying that our leaders make decisions that are in accordance with fearing God in his word. In, in this case, Elisha is trying to help a leader who is ungodly, hoping that he would repent, that he would change and he would forsake his sin and walk with the Lord and that it would trickle down and influence the nation. I think that's a side application. I don't think that's the main point of this text. But should we not pray for our leaders, our government leaders? Whether you like them or not, we are called as believers to pray for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. 1 Timothy 2, we're called to pray for our leaders. No matter what side of the aisle you're on, we should hope that our leaders establish laws and principles that are in accordance with the word of God, that are in a fear of God. So my hope side application is that we try to influence our leaders in a hope that they influence our nation so that we stop doing things that are wrong. And our nation is doing a lot of things that are wrong. And I hope that God changes our nation. So Elisha is trying to minister to this king numerous times in this text. We're going to see, or, or, or in 2 Kings, Elisha is trying to, to help this king, Jehoram, and reveal the power of God. 
in hopes that he would change, that he would repent, he would respond to what God is doing, respond to God's power, respond to God's grace, so that hopefully he would lead a nation in a revival. So Elisha's ministering to this king, and the king is seeing that Elisha is helping him. But going back to the Syrian king, the king of Aram, verse 11, now the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing. And he called his servants and he said, will you tell me which of us is for the king of Israel? Translation, who's the mole? <laughs> who's the traitor? Every time I tell you this is where I want us to go to set up an ambush, they already know we're there. And they're not there. And the king is getting very frustrated over this. He's saying, what's the deal, guys? Who can I not trust in my inner circle? And one of the servants, who's in the inner circle, said, No, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. He's saying, there's this prophet in Israel that, that he even knows what you're talking about in secret. So then the king is thinking, hmm, this is a problem. I've got to get rid of this problem. So verse 13, he says, go and see where he is that I may send him and take him. And it was told him saying, behold, he is in Dothan. So the king sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. So the king is thinking, if I can take care of this Elisha problem, then I can actually start winning some battles here. Now, it's, it's kind of comical when we read this because you guys hopefully are seeing if Elisha is given word by God on what to do and Elisha is given preparation on where the Syrians are going to be, wouldn't God also probably tell Elisha that the Syrians are coming to Dothan to get him? <laughs> I mean... Wouldn't it make sense that if Elisha knows where they're going to be in advance, that Elisha would probably know that they're coming to him right now? But also, in a broader sense, the king should have known that Elisha was aligned with God. Much like David was aligned with Yahweh, the Lord God, when he fought against Goliath, Elisha, time and time again, was on God's side. And this king, his name is Ben-Hadad. He knew that. In 1 Kings 20, we see that this Syrian king named Ben-Hadad had fought against King Ahab, Jehoram's dad. Later in this chapter, we see him named by name, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who's fighting against Jehoram, Ahab's son. This king, this Syrian king, had multiple times been at war with Israel, and God had done something very unique in his interaction with them. God had miraculously delivered Israel so that this Syrian king saw it. This is also the king that sent his general Nahum, or excuse me, Naaman, who had leprosy, to go get cured. And who is the instrumental figure that was associated with Naaman getting cured? Obviously it was God, but it was through Elisha. Naaman went to Elisha. Elisha didn't even come out. He sent somebody and said, go get in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be clean. Naaman is cured, and then Naaman probably goes back and tells this king, hey, I'm cured, there was this prophet named Elisha, and he was instrumental in telling me to go dip in the Jordan River seven times, and now I'm clean again. So this king was not ignorant of who Elisha was. So you would think, why are you fighting against Elisha? Because if you're fighting against Elisha, you're fighting against Elisha's God. And if Elisha is, is aware of where I'm going to be, then you would think, well, wouldn't he be aware of my plan to get him? So anyways, he sends this army to Dothan, okay? Dothan is a town about 12 miles from Syria. I didn't know this until I saw it this week in the readings that Dothan is mentioned one other time in the Bible. And it's when Joseph was thrown into a pit by his brothers in Genesis 37. And there is an image of Joseph uh, being surrounded by people who are hostile to him in this place of Dothan. All right? So this king of Syria is sending his army to surround Elisha in this same town as Dothan. So verse 14, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night, and they surrounded the city. 
So kind of when I read this text, I see them probably being quiet. It's nighttime. They're surrounding the city so that in the morning, everybody can see, "Uh uh-oh, there's a problem. So in the morning, verse 15, when the attendant of the man of God, that's a servant of Elisha, had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And the servant said to Elisha, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He says, Oh no, what are we going to do? We're being surrounded by this army of chariots and horses. What do we do? That's kind of a natural response to an obstacle, right? I don't know about you, but me, when I face a big obstacle, my natural response is to think, What am I going to do? What do I do? And it's, it's very easy and very natural for us to become afraid, to go into fear, to become panicked, to kind of focus only on the physical of what is right in front of you instead of stepping back and thinking about the spiritual God who is in control and trusting him. Remember in the Gospels when Jesus was interacting with his disciples and oftentimes they'd find themselves in these predicaments and the disciples would be afraid and Jesus would say, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? The contrast in the, in the Gospels of, of fear is faith. Why are you afraid? Believe. Why are you afraid? Where is your faith? So, This servant sees this big obstacle, this Syrian army circling the city, and he's scared. And he says, oh, oh no, what are we going to do? What do you think, what do you think Elisha's going to say? Elisha said in verse 16, he answered, do not fear. Sounds kind of like Jesus, right? Don't be afraid. Do not fear. Now this is interesting. For those who are with us, are more than those who are with them. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, until we get to the next verse, don't look ahead yet, you would say, well, who's he talking about? It's Elisha and Elisha's servant and probably the people of Dothan, right? But the servant's scared when he sees the army. Implication is the army's going to take him. So what, what is Elisha talking about? Those who are with us are more than those who are with him. Now, let's look ahead in verse 17. Then Elisha prayed and he said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. God provided. That was an army of angels surrounding. It doesn't say it was surrounding Dothan. It said it was surrounding Elisha. Look at the text in verse 17. The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha. I don't think that's an accident that it says it was around Elisha as opposed to it was around the city. I think the point of the text is to show that God is providing protection for his person, for his people. The only time in scripture where a chariot of fire, that phrase chariot of fire happens actually four chapters earlier. When Elisha is with his mentor, Elijah, and God takes Elijah up into heaven, that they're walking out in a chariot of fire separates the two of them, and then Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind. I remember this story as a kid my whole life, and it wasn't until this week that I realized that the text doesn't say Elijah got in the chariot. I always thought Elijah just rides off in this chariot. It says that he was taken up in a whirlwind. It says a chariot was there. And a lot of people say that that chariot, chariots of fire here in this text, 
chariots, it's, it's God's army. It was probably an angel escort that was taking him up to the Lord. And God sends this army of angels, this, these chariots of fire and these horses to surround Elisha in a dimension that the servant hadn't seen before. See, when he woke up, he sees these horses and these chariots of the Syrians, and he becomes afraid. And Elisha is so calm. It, it reminds me so much of Jesus in the Gospels when everybody's freaking out, and Jesus is like, it's okay, it's okay. Because I think Jesus' spiritual eyes were open. Obviously, he's the Son of God, right? You think that. But, but there's an element in which Jesus, as the Son of Man, I think is trying to teach us, you can trust God. Jesus submitted to his Father. He, he, he submitted to the Spirit in doing his miracles. I think when Jesus is telling his disciples, it's okay, have faith. He's saying, open your eyes. You're on God's side. You have the Lord God on your side. Much like David, everybody saw this little boy going against this massive warrior. And David says, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. There's a perspective. David's eyes were opened. He said, you may be a lot bigger than me. <laughs> you may be a lot better than me, but you ain't better than my God. And I'm on his side. So Elisha tells his servant, or he, he prays. He says, oh Lord, I pray that you would open his eyes. And the Lord opened the eyes of his servant. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they had came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord. Again, Elisha is praying. He's not doing this in his own authority. He's asking God to do something. And he prays and he says, I should. Strike these people with blindness, I pray. Well, the people he's talking about are the Syrian army. So in, in verse 17, he asked the Lord to open the eyes of his servant. And then in verse 18, he asked the Lord to close the eyes of the enemy. So God struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he brought them to Samaria. So he's, he's telling this army, hey, I'll take you to where you want to go, but you have to follow me. So he takes him on this 12-mile route to get to Samaria. Now in the New Testament, we think of Samaria as an area, the Samaritans, and that's true. It's a general area, but in this time in history, Samaria was actually a city. It was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Kind of like in our day today, we've got the state of Washington out in the Pacific Northwest. We've got the city of Washington, D.C., or the district of Washington, D.C. Same thing, but this time he's talking about the city. So he takes them to the capital city. Well, who do you think is going to be in the capital city of Israel? The king of Israel. And probably a lot of his soldiers right? This is like headquarters. This is mission control. This is where all the armies of Israel are probably centered. So Elisha takes them into the smack dab in the middle of Samaria. Verse 20, and it came about when they had come into Samaria that Elisha said, oh Lord, again, he's praying. He's asking for God to do this. A lot like Jesus too. When Jesus performed miracles, he would pray and ask God to help. Elisha says, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. So how do you think these guys feel now? <laughs> Uh-oh. We came to have a little ambush on him. Now our eyes are opened and we're the ones in the center of being surrounded by those who can ambush us. Then the king of Israel, when he saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And it, to me, this is, this is how a natural person thinks. These are my enemies, so I guess I should kill them, right? I mean, they're the ones coming against us, so, so the natural thing to do is kill them, right? I mean, that's what they're trying to do to us. And look what Elisha says. He's telling him, don't just think in the natural. He says, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? 
translation, would you kill a prisoner of war? If you had beat them in battle and they surrendered and you brought them back, would you kill them then? Of course you wouldn't do that. So why would you kill them when God serves them to you on a platter? And then this is what he tells them to do. He says, set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. He says, feed them. <laughs> Give them water and let them go. Does that sound familiar to anything in the New Testament? That maybe Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Or, or Paul in Romans 12 that says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Let God take care of that. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, verse 23 so the king prepared a great feast for them. When they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the marauding bands of the Arameans, or the Syrians, did not come again into the land of Israel. That lasted for a little while. Because <laughs> the very next verse says that after a little while, they came and <laughs> attacked them. Um, the marauding bands, I would say, are different than a full-on invasion. What they were doing here were these little raids, kind of like acts of terrorism. Uh, the next verse says that later on they come full force in a, in a full out siege of Samaria. That lasted for a little while. But I want to stop there because I think that the text takes a different, it, it comes into something that's a different uh, account from what we just looked at today. What I want to focus on is what we looked at today. We, we see that this perspective of Elisha and his servant is like a perspective of a person thinking in the physical, in the natural, in the concrete, in the rational, in the logical. What can I do? How can I control the situation? What do I need to do to fix my problem? Whereas I think the other perspective is God's in control. What can God do to fix my problem? Am I walking with the Lord? Am I presenting this before him? Notice that, that Elisha's response when he saw the problem was peace. It was not fear. But the first thing he did was, what did he do? He prayed. I don't think that's an accident that that's in the text either. That Elisha's first response was prayer. He prayed for his servant. And then he prayed for other things. And I think that there was lots of lessons he was trying to show all sorts of people involved in this account in relationship with the Lord. Think about this. Okay. Think about the perspective of the servant. All right. I think Elisha was trying to show him by seeing this angelic army. You can remember that God will provide. That God will protect. What was the lesson that he was trying to teach I think to show the Syrian army. You need to, to stop fighting against God's people. Right? What was the lesson that he was trying to show the Israelite army and the people of Israel? Hey, we need to respond to God's grace. It was God's grace that he provided this army right in front of us on a silver platter. And then we send them back. There's a different way of thinking. God showed grace on us. Maybe we should trust him. Maybe we should fear him. Maybe we should obey his commandments. What was the lesson that Elisha was probably trying to teach King Jehoram, the king of Israel? Again, respond to God's grace, repent of your sin. This king had seen evidence and evidence after evidence and evidence of what God was doing for his people and how he was using the prophet Elisha to, to reveal himself to this king. And the king continually rejected the revelation that was given to him. He continued in sin. He rejected the opportunity of repentance and turning to the Lord in faith. What was the lesson that might have been taught to King Benadad in Syria? He also had an opportunity to stop fighting against God's people. He also had an opportunity to recognize that the Lord God is the only God on, on, on the earth. 
the, the, the creator of heaven and earth. He is the one true God. He's the maker of it all. He's not the God on the earth. He's the God who created the earth. I'm sorry I misspoke. He had an opportunity, too, to learn what was going on. He had been shown grace. And yet later on in the text, he goes off and, and fully invades Israel later on in the chapter. He didn't learn his lesson either. So what lesson do I want us to learn? I said I wanted us to leave here with our eyes wide open, spiritually speaking, so that we would have peace and we would be more effective, so that we would have more peace. Who had peace in this story? Which character had peace? Elisha had peace, right? Why did he have peace? Because he saw the unseen. He believed in what other people couldn't see. He believed in the one true God. He knew that God looks out for his people. He was aware of a spiritual dimension, whereas other people were only living in a physical world. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6, we're in a spiritual dimension within a physical world. And it's not a time of peace. It's a time of war. America, we think of ourselves as living in this time of peace right now. But the Bible says we're living in a spiritual era of war. And our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against rulers and principalities of darkness. It's against Satan and demons who want us to not fear God. Who want us to not trust God. Who want us to doubt God. Who want us to disobey God. Who want us to ignore God. And Elisha was aware of the spiritual dimension. And I want you to be aware of a spiritual battle against you as a believer. And when I say believer, I'm not meaning every single person in the world. I mean only someone who's trusted in Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross to pay for your sins. The Bible says... We all start off at enmity with God. We all are in the sin of Adam and the sin of our own choice. Okay, we fell when Adam fell, and we fall when we fall too. We have a problem called sin, and God cannot tolerate sin. It causes a separation between us and God. And the penalty, the wages of that sin is, is eternal death. It's, it's separation from God eternally. We know it as hell. One day it's going to be called the lake of fire. And that is a reality for anyone who is not trusted in God's provision. And his provision is the person of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the son of God. His work was he died on the cross. He shed his blood. We just talked about it in the Lord's Supper. He gave up his body. He bore our sins in his body. He shed his blood for us. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And he makes that offer, that invitation, that complete and final sacrifice, payment for sins, offer forgiveness, the righteousness of Christ is given to those who receive it by faith. Jesus rose from the grave. He's alive. He ascended into heaven. He is victorious over death. He paid for sin. He's coming again. And that is awesome news if you're on his side. But if you're not on his side, that's terrifying news. David was not afraid of Goliath because he knew whose side he was on. Elisha was not afraid of the Syrian army because he knew who was sending his angelic army. You live in a spiritual world. And if you've trusted in Jesus, you can have peace. And you don't need to fear so that when you see the obstacle, it's a real obstacle. It's a problem. But you have a God that you can go to in prayer. Elisha went to the Lord in prayer. Think about the, the passage in Ephesians 6. I want to read a few verses when he talks about this spiritual warfare. And he, and he talks about, Paul talks about us uh, putting on the full armor of God. And he goes through all these things that, that we are to embrace as believers. And then finally, when he gets through explaining the armor of God that you need to battle up, you need to gear up in this spiritual dimension. In verse 18, you know what Paul says? 
He says the very next thing after he says, I want to read it. Verse 17, take on the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The very next verse, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. Pray in a spiritual way with the Holy Spirit who is inside of you as a believer You have God, the Holy Spirit, inside of you so that you can have peace and that you can pray to God in a way that He accepts your prayer. The Spirit helps us pray when we don't even know how to pray. The Spirit helps us. He's he's an intercessor. God the Son, Jesus, is also called an intercessor, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And what do you think He's saying as an intercessor for us in heaven right now. If you've trusted in Jesus, he's saying, paid for them, paid for them. They're mine, they're mine. I've paid for that sin. They are mine, they are forgiven, they are mine. Jesus is the mediator. He's the intercessor. The Spirit is also the intercessor who helps us pray. And he's saying, pray at all times in the Spirit. Now get this. With this in view, be on the alert. Translation, open your eyes. What do you see? He's saying, pray and have your spiritual eyes open. Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes. Then he prayed for the Syrians, O Lord, close their eyes. Then he prayed, O Lord, open their eyes again. What Paul's saying here is there's a real spiritual world. You need to be dependent upon the Lord. This is what he can offer you. You need to pray and access his power, access his peace, and be on the alert. Open your eyes with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. If you have Jesus, you've got it made. You've got it. You've got it made. And we're all going to go through trials, road bumps, tribulations, obstacles, people who are against us. That's reality. But there's also another reality. Much like Joshua, or excuse me, Elisha said to his servant, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Jesus is the overcomer, and if we're with him, we are overcomers. We can have peace, we can experience peace, we can be more effective when we are dependent upon him, when we are seeking him in prayer. When we are addressing our obstacles in a spiritual dimension and not just a physical, natural response. We can do it. But the only way we can do it is we look to Him for help. Cannot do it on our own. If you do life on your own, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be really frustrated. And and even with the Lord, you're still going to experience disappointments. You're still going to experience frustrations in this life. But we don't live for this life. We live for eternity because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for this passage of seeing how you worked through Elisha to reveal yourself to many people, to remind us that in you we do not have to fear, that in you we can have peace, that in you we can be reminded that you are on our side and that you love us and you want us to trust you, you want us to seek you, you want us to depend on you, you want us to fear you, you want us to obey you, you want us to love you. I ask that you would help us love you and respond to your grace this morning and thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. And if you are or what I would call earlier a 
not a believer, someone who's never trusted in Jesus Christ, I ask that you would pray with me if you want and say, God, I'm a sinner. I do not deserve your salvation. I do not deserve your forgiveness. I do not deserve eternal life. But I place my faith solely in Jesus Christ, your son. And I believe that on the cross, he paid for my sins completely, fully, finally. That he bore my sin on his body, he shed his blood so that I could be forgiven and that I receive his righteousness by faith. And my salvation is your work, that it is an act of your grace and your mercy. It is not my work. And I am placing my faith exclusively in what you have done for me. And because of that, I am now saved. And I have hope in this life. In Jesus' name we pray.